Okay, welcome back everyone. We are discussing what I call the heuristic approach to general relativity. So in this section we will try to develop the general ideas how we have to modify space-time theory in order to include gravity. And then in the next section we will really develop the necessary mathematical formalism, formalism for doing this. So I started by um, talking a little bit about uh, the problem which arises when we try to include Newtonian gravity into special relativity. And where the result of this little discussion will actually be that it simply doesn't work. So I began by writing down the basic equations of Newton's theory of gravity. So this consists essentially uh, of two equations. The first is a field equation. Laplace phi is 4 pi g mu. Mu is a mass density, phi is a gravitational potential, and g is a gravitational constant. And then we have the equation of motion, which is m in Newtonian notation d2x by dt squared is minus ms gradient of phi. So I distinguish the inertial mass and the uh, the gravitational mass, which just as an experimental uh, result we find actually to be equal for all bodies. But the theory doesn't give us any reason for this. So let's denote this here, equation 1 and this equation 2. As we discussed already that they are not Lorentz invariant, so they don't fit into the general framework of special relativity. That's quite obvious because these operators involve only spatial derivatives. So if we perform a Lorentz transformation, obviously these equations change their form. So they are obviously not Lorentz invariant. So what one could try, and what was actually the first thing people did try when uh, special relativity uh, had come into existence, what one could try is to modify the equation so that they become Lorentz invariant, and then one would have a gravitational theory in the framework of special relativity. So an obvious idea is, and we talked already about this, to modify this by making the uh, Laplace operator into a wave operator, 4 pi g mu, and to make a four-vector equation out of this three-vector notation, uh, three-vector equation, by, uh, and also in order to make it Lorentz invariant to replace the coordinate time by proper time. So then we would get something of this sort. Second derivative is respect to proper time of now the x mu with four components could be minus ms d mu phi. So this is a d with a lower index mu and then uh, the index is, uh, is pushed upwards with, uh, with the eta. So let's call this one prime and two prime. So these equations are Lorentz invariant. We already talked about this. Provided that we assume that mu and phi are Lorentz invariant. Uh, Lorentz invariant. And that assumption is a little bit of a, of a novelty when we come from Newtonian physics because we would read this in a natural way as a mass density in the inertial system in which we write down this equation. But then of course it would not be a Lorentz invariant because the volume is not Lorentz invariant, right? So if we insist on interpreting this as a mass density in the inertial system, then actually this assumption would not be satisfied and then the equation would not be Lorentz invariant. So the way out is, I think this was the last remark I made uh, in the last lecture, so the way out would be to say this is not the mass density in the inertial system, it's always the rest mass density, the mass density in the rest system. This would work. So we say in whatever inertial system we write down this equation, what is standing here, is always the mass density in the rest system. So this is meaningful only if 
mu is interpreted as mass density in the rest system. This obviously is a Lorentz invariant. Yeah? So then I would assume gravity is described by a scalar field, which is denoted phi, and this should take the same value in every inertial system. And then this would be a Lorentz invariant equation. And the second equation would always be Lorentz invariant. So one would say, okay, fine, we have succeeded. The unfortunate thing is that this is an utter disagreement. The second equation is an utter disagreement with observations. And you see this immediately if you consider the uh, equation for mu equals zero. The other three are good approximations for the old Newtonian equations, right? The only difference is if you look at the first uh, three components, the components where this is one, two, three, that um, uh, tau is replaced by t. Uh, so this, this involves square roots of 1 minus v squared over c squared, the difference. And as long as the velocities are small, then you recover this here um, in a good approximation. So that's fine. But it's quite different for the zero component. So, but the equation 2 prime is in utter disagreement. with observation. From u equals 0. Because what do we get from u equals 0? From u equals 0 we have m d2 d tau squared x0 is minus ms d0 phi. And now we, remember, we recall what this, what this was. So here I have the first derivative of dx naught by d tau, and that's just u naught. And here I have minus ms eta naught naught d naught phi. So this is m d by d tau, sorry, c over the square root. And on the right hand side I have a minus one here. So I get a plus ms, and that's 1 over c dt phi. And I look at this. Is this a reasonable equation? No, it's obvious nonsense. Consider the case that the phi is time independent. Okay, they have a gravitational field which is independent on time. So my masses are just uh, at rest in the system I'm considering. Then this would be 0. And this would mean that the v must be zero. Well, uh, that's the derivative of v must be zero, so v must be constant. So in a time-independent field, only motion with constant v would be possible, which is, of course, complete nonsense. Yeah? If you have a time-independent field, gravitational field, particles would move in a, in a, pla in a planetary system. Yeah? The phi is time-independent. The field around a, a star, a spherical star, time-independent. And the particles, of course, they move in Kepler ellipses and things like that. So the V is far from being constant. Yeah? So this is obviously, this is an obvious contradiction to, uh, to what we observe. So this doesn't work. So another attempt one could make is, so modify 2 prime into another equation so that it does give the right Newtonian equation by adding something here on the right hand side, namely doing this here. So the old formula was minus ms and then I had just d mu phi. Add a term which, uh, which removes this obvious contradiction to experiment. And what one could do is one could add something like dx mu by d tau d nu of phi, or let me write this with a lower index, dx nu by d tau. So this is still Lorentz invariant, and if you check the Newtonian limits, then you get also for the zero component something reasonable. So this would be two double prime. And actually, if you combine one prime and two double prime, then you have a theory which is Lorentz invariant, and which at least at first sight is not an obvious, it uh, doesn't give uh, obvious nonsense. So this was a theory which was considered for some time as being something reasonable. 
So one prime and two prime. That's a theory which was considered by people at some time. And in particular, it was investigated in great detail by the Finnish um, theoretician um, Gunnar Nordström. So this is known as Nordström's first theory. Nordström's first theory. And this was discussed for quite a while. But what people found out was also for these equations when ran into contradiction to experiments. They are not so obvious as it was with this equation, so I couldn't explain this here in a few minutes. So I just mentioned it as a, as a historical remark that um, it was not able to really reproduce a planetary motion with this, with this set of equations. So also this was given up after a while. And uh, yeah, there were some other attempts to modify the equations further. So for instance, well, with because this is called Nordstrom's first theory, you probably already guessed that Nordstrom also developed other theories. So for instance, Nordstrom tried also something to modify this here by replacing box phi with phi times box phi, for instance. That's then known as Nordstrom's second theory. And he also modified the equation of motion in a different way. Einstein worked on theories of this sort for a while. Well, we are just, uh, we are just celebrating um, uh, the fact that 100 years ago, uh, Albert Einstein was in Prague for a year. 1912, he spent a little bit more than one year at the German University in Prague. And at this time, he developed uh, his own uh, Lorentz invariant uh, scalar theory of gravity. So it's quite similar to this theory, where we have a scalar potential. You try to make the equation Lorentz invariant, and you try to be in agreement with all experiments. But also Einstein's theory, which he developed together with his young collaborator Fokker, also this theory failed. And there's another one by me, this also failed. So all these theories are considered as what we call Lorentz invariant scalar theories of gravity. Of gravity. So there's this one by, uh, uh, by Nordström. And then there were other ones suggested by, for instance, the list is not complete. For instance, Einstein, Gustav Mie in Freiburg developed a theory of this sort. And uh, Nordström developed several versions, not only the one I've mentioned here. And all of them failed. So what do I mean when I say, well, Lorentz invariance is clear, right? So you try to formulate a theory which fits into the framework of special relativity. So the equation should be invariant under Lorentz transformations, which uh, go from one inertial system to another. And we call it a scalar theory because the gravitational field is described by a scalar function. Yeah, that's what we mean by a scalar theory uh, in a Lorentz invariant setting. And so all these theories, all of them are in disagreement with experiment. Some of them also has just, have just um, uh, conceptual uh, problems, but anyway, they are um, in disagreement with experiment. So this was a failure. And actually, this extended over quite some time. 1905, special relativity was um, established. And in the years until general relativity came to in the, into existence, this was until 1915, many, well, not many, but uh, uh, a certain number of, uh, of uh, quite, uh, quite good uh, theoretical physicists tried to find theories of this sort, and all of them failed. So this simply doesn't work. So then they tried something else. Well, there's a, maybe a, a an idea which, uh, which uh, seems quite natural if you look at this equation. How could you modify this um, uh, in another way? So here we are talking about scalar theories. So like a Newtonian theory, we assume that the gravitational field is described by a scalar. And then we should also have a scalar on the right-hand side. And the natural candidate would be the mass density in the rest system. Only then it could work. But now we have learned from special relativity that mass is but a special form of energy. 
And you could speculate uh, why, why is just the mass the source of the gravitational field? If it is only a special form of energy, if it can be converted into other forms of energies, wouldn't it be natural to assume that any sort of energy is a source of the gravitational field? So you would replace this here by something which describes the energy density. But then, well, you know by what mathematical object the energy density is described in special relativity. It's this energy momentum tensor, which has two indices. So this would naturally lead to the idea to replace this scalar term here by something with two indices. So you may think of something which can be arranged in a matrix scheme. And then also the gravitational field should have two indices. It should not be a scalar. So that's the second group of theories which was tried where we do not try to find the Lorentz invariant scalar theory of gravity, but a scalar invariant tensor theory of gravity, where gravity is described by a thing with two indices. So another attempt, and in particular Einstein tried this for quite some, some while. Another attempt was to replace mu by the energy momentum tensor. Energy momentum tensor. So then you have something on the right hand side of the field equation with two indices. And if it's supposed to be an equation, then the left hand side should also have two indices, right? So you would. Any question? Okay. So uh, you should find the gravitational field. Should be described yeah I, I write just vaguely by something with two indices and if you try to do this the sort of theory which you develop uh, then that's what we call Lorentz invariant tensor theories of gravities of gravity so such Lorentz invariant I should either write it always with a hyphen or never Lorentz invariant tensor series were suggested by for instance Einstein. Several versions actually. And again, they failed. All of them failed. Oops. Well, when I say they failed, I mean either uh, of two things. Either they uh, were just conceptually not, uh, not consistent, or they were in disagreement with the experiment. So this was again a failure. Parallel to this line of thought, so here's a line of thought was try to modify the equations of gravity in such a way that they fit into, special, uh, into the special theory of relativity. Parallel to this approach, Einstein developed another idea. And this idea finally uh, led to the, to the success. And this idea was that maybe the space-time theory itself should be changed. So here the idea was we leave the space-time theory as it was, special relativity based on these two postulates, P1 and P2. And we try to modify gravity in a way that it fits into this framework. And the new idea is maybe this doesn't work. Maybe we have to modify the space-time theory. Maybe gravity is just a new sort of space-time theory. So the correct theory of gravity, the correct and working relativistic version of gravity is just a new theory of space-time, not a theory of a, spa of a field on space-time. And this was the idea which finally led uh, to the success. And, well, if we give up this idea to uh, fit gravity into special relativity, then, of course, we need a new guiding principle, right? So here's a guiding principle was Lorentz invariance. So we try to make the theory in such a way that it is Lorentz invariant. 
If we say we give this up, we make a new space-time theory, then at the beginning you don't know what to, what to assume at all, how to start at all. And, uh, well, Einstein was led by three things which he called principles. And one of them is uh, really essential. I think it is the cornerstone of uh, relativity, of general relativity. That's the so-called equivalence principle. And we will now talk about this in quite some detail. The other two principles he used were the so-called principle of general relativity, or general relativity principle, Allgemeines Relativitätsprinzip in German, where people discuss uh, how relevant it really is. It played an important role in Einstein's own thinking, but nowadays most people think it is actually not so essential for the development of general relativity. And the third one is the so-called Macht principle, Macht's principle, which also was named by Einstein in this way, and which also played an important role in his own thinking. But again, people nowadays are of the opinion, most people are of the opinion, that it is not really very relevant for relativity. So the Guiding principle, which certainly is very important, is the equivalence principle. And we will now talk about this in quite some detail. So, so Einstein tried a new approach. Oh, actually, he did this more or less simultaneously. Yeah, it was not the way that for a couple of years he tried uh, these Lorentz invariant theories, and he stopped this and did something new. He came back from one to the other from time to time. So the scalar theories he developed in 1912, 1913 or so, and uh, the, the equivalence principle was around already in 1907. So it, it was not a, not a straight line. It was a, a line with, with many, with many uh, twists and, and, and curves. So Einstein tried another approach. Based on what he called principles. So here in this context, a principle, I would say, is just a, a, guiding, a guiding thought, an idea which, uh, which guides us in which way we, uh, we develop a theory. Uh, and actually there are three of them, which he called the equivalence principle. The general relativity principle and Mach's principle. So he named this after the um, after the Viennese uh, physicist and philosopher Ernst Mach. So I will discuss in great detail the equivalence principle, and uh, at the end of this section, I will make brief remarks about the other two principles. So in my view, they are actually not so, so essential for the understanding of relativity. So we discuss now the equivalence principle. Well, what's the starting point for the equivalence principle? The starting point is this observation, which is a pure coincidence in Newtonian theory, that for all bodies we know, the quotient of M and NS is a constant of nature. Yeah? So if we use the same units for the both thing, then they are just the same. So then we can equate M and uh, MS, and then this drops out here. So this is something which, uh, of course, uh, as you certainly all know, was first uh, discovered by Galileo. Yeah? So actually, it's something which is not uh, obvious from our everyday experience. Well, what does it mean? It means that in a gravitational field, all bodies uh, 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 undergo the same acceleration. If I have, choose the same initial condition for two bodies in the same gravitational field, then they move in the same way. They get the same acceleration. And at first sight, it's against our intuition. Yeah, if I have a, this piece of chalk and I let it freely fall here and I compare this with a bird's feather, with I, with I drop here, then our everyday experience will say that they are, that they are accelerated in quite different ways. Yeah, the chalk will fall straight to the, to the floor and the bird's feather will, will move very slowly and maybe, maybe land uh, uh, at, uh, at quite another place. But uh, uh, the rather, rather admirable uh, observation by Galileo was 
that this is just an effect of the, of the interaction with the air, of friction with the air, right? If we do this in vacuum, then the bird's feather would fall in exactly the same way as a chalk. So if we are really in the situation that there's only a gravitational field, no other forces, no frictions and things like that, no interaction with the air, then all bodies fall in the same way. And this has been experimentally tested, well, in a fairly rough way by Galileo in the 17th century, and then later with fairly high precision. And Einstein now uh, brought forward the idea that this is not just a coincidence, but that this rather is a guiding principle in order to find the correct theory for gravity. So the equivalence principle, the first and simplest version of the equivalence principle, is just the statement that this is a fundamental law of nature. It's not a coincidence. So it just says that inertial mass and gravitational mass must be equal. That's our first version of the equivalence principle. And in this version, it's called the weak equivalence principle. So the simplest, so what we call the weak equivalence principle. So weak equivalence principle that just the statement that um, inertial mass is gravitational mass. So that we require that this is true for all bodies. And if we base a theory of this assumption, then, of course, um, uh, we are in trouble whenever this uh, is uh, disproved by experiment, right? So uh, it really relies on, on this assumption, whatever we, we derive now on the, on the basis of this principle. So this has a consequence, if we assume this, the obvious consequence, obvious reformulation. Equivalent reformulation is that um, uh, the motion of a freely falling body, freely falling means that there are no other forces acting on the thing uh, other than gravitational force. So for instance, no friction with air and things like that, and nobody is kicking the body, and there are no electromagnetic fields which could accelerate the body if it is charged. So it's just opposed to gravity and to nothing else. The motion of a freely falling particle depends only on initial position and initial velocity. So it does not depend on any particular properties of the bodies. Yeah? If it is made out of, uh, out of chalk or out of butter or whatever, yeah? it's always the, same, always the same motion. So that's another formulation in which you can, fall, uh, can formulate the weak equivalence principle. So these are equivalent um, formulations of this. If you formulate it in this way, then you often call it the law of university of free fall. So that's what we call universe, universality of free fall. And it's sometimes abbreviated UFF. So that's just another version of the weak equivalence principle. And this has important consequences how we experience gravitational fields. And uh, that's where Einstein's famous, accelerate, uh, famous elevator comes into the game. So in order to illustrate this situation, in order to visualize this, Einstein very often used this, um, uh, this idea of, a, of an elevator. So you are inside a box which is closed. So there are no windows, we cannot look outside. And the question is, uh, how can I distinguish the following two situations? The first situation is that I'm in an inertial system. So there are, uh, the box is, um, is moving rectilinear and uniformly uh, in the way as we discussed it in special relativity. So in particular, there's no gravitational field. That's the first situation. 
And the other situation is that we are here in the gravitational field of the Earth and we let the box drop. Yeah? So we are in an elevator and somebody cuts the rope and then we are falling. And we are only discussing the time during we are falling, not the moment when, when it actually smashes on the ground. Yeah? Only the, the, the period when, when the thing is falling. And the claim is, if this is true, that we cannot distinguish the two situations as long as we only observe freely falling particles. Yeah? So in the first situation, where I'm in an inertial system, no gravitational field, and we, we throw uh, pieces of chalk at each other or things like that and watch how, how they move. And we do the same thing now in the falling elevator. They will move in precisely the same way. Yeah, we couldn't distinguish the two situations. So that's the third formulation. So free fall experiments. In a box, As by box I mean something which is closed. I cannot look outside. Yeah, but if I had the possibility to look outside and see what is around, then of course I could get additional information. But the idea is that I'm just closed into this, uh, enclosed into this, into this box, and I cannot look outside. So free fall experiments in a box in an inertial system. are undistinguishable from free fall experiments in a box in a homogeneous gravitational field. Of course, if the field is not of a, I forgot the most important thing in a freely falling, oops, box in a homogeneous gravitational field. So here in this room, the gravitational field is homogeneous to a very good approximation. Yeah, it's not precisely homogeneous. Actually, the gravitational field always points to the center of the Earth, right? So the vector, the acceleration vector here and the acceleration vector here are not perfectly parallel. They are a little bit inclined with respect to each other. But on scales like the size of this room, we can neglect this. So we could consider the field as homogeneous. So if we would close uh, uh, the window and if we uh, could uh, make this room uh, freely falling in the gravitational field, then we would have exactly the same impressions as if uh, somebody has, uh, if he is uh, in the... Uh, in, in free space, in a spacecraft where no gravitational field is around and where he is moving under, under no influence of gravity. So let me draw a picture to illustrate this. Oops. So in the first situation, we have the box. Uh, 
yeah, just in uh, an inertial system. So here I have, so it's far away from all masses, no gravitational fields acting on, on the box, and it is just an inertial motion. And the other situation is that we are here on the Earth in a gravitational field. So the acceleration wants to pull the box downward and we have no resistance. No, nothing stops the box from falling. So it's freely falling in this gravitational field. And the claim is, if the weak equivalence principle is true, then if we observe uh, objects, freely falling objects in this box, and we observe them in this box, that we cannot uh, distinguish the situation. So they move here, of course, uh, in, in straight lines. They will also here move in straight lines relative to the box. Yeah? Of course, not relative to the, uh, to the uh, reference system, where the, uh, which is uh, at rest relative to the, to the gravitational field. But relative to the box, they would also move in straight lines. And uh, well, the most interesting formulation, that's the last reformulation of the principle I will give, is the thing that we, yeah, that we turn around the situation here. So instead of having the box moving in the gravitational field and at rest in an inertial system, we do it the other way around. We have it moving in the inertial system and at rest in the gravitational field. And this should also be equivalent. It's just a transformation uh, from this situation to other, uh, other reference frames in both situations. So we could also consider the box at rest in the gravitational field. So that's the situation we are in here. Yeah? This room, fortunately, is at rest relative to the system in which the gravitational field exists. It's not freely falling. And we could mimic this, mimic this situation by accelerating the box relative to the inertial system. That would also be the same. So the third reformulation is the following. And that's the most instructive. In, in a box at rest, uh, sorry, uh, in a box uh, uniformly accelerated, uniformly accelerated to an inertial system. All free fall experiments. are indistinguishable. From free fall experiments. In a homogeneous gravitational field. Let me again draw a picture for this. So again, we have the situation where we are, uh, uh, where no gravitational field is around, and we have a gravitational field. That's the other situation. For instance, here on the Earth, gravitational field. But in this case, we do not consider a box at rest here and accelerated here, but just the other way around. So we have this here accelerated. We have this here accelerated. So accelerated box relative to inertial system. So we think of being far away from all masses, out in space, in the spacecraft and somebody pulls the spacecraft with constant acceleration in a certain direction, with a rope or something like that. So you may imagine something. You, ask, you will not be able to realize it, but you can imagine something of this sort in your, in your mind. And you consider it with the situation that the box is at rest in a gravitational field. So here we would feel the effect of the acceleration, which is upward, 
which gives me the impression that relative to the box, there is uh, an acceleration downward, right? And here you have the acceleration downward coming from the gravitational field. And again, as long as the equivalence principle is true, the situation should be indistinguishable as long as I only observe free-fall experiments. And that's a really, really intriguing idea. This means I can mimic gravitational fields, at least homogeneous gravitational fields. Yeah, of course, this doesn't work if the gravitational field is inhomogeneous. Yeah, if the acceleration is really not a constant inside the box. So the box must, must be small enough so that the gravitational field can be considered as homogeneous. As long as this is true, I can mimic this situation, the situation we are in here. We are in a gravitational field which uh, uh, provides a downward acceleration to ev anybody. We can mimic this situation if we are far away from all gravitating masses by accelerating the whole thing in a certain direction. And then the gravitational field, the mimic gravitational field, would of course act in the opposite direction. So this is true on the basis of physics which was known at Einstein's, uh, at Einstein's time as long as we only observe free-fall experiments. You might say, as soon as I do something else, if I do experiments with light or thermodynamic experiments or whatever, whatever uh, else may come to your mind, then of course it would not be true, one would think. Right? So for instance, if I send a light ray here through this room, where the basic understanding at the time of Einstein was that light is not influenced by a gravitational field. Yeah, so the light ray would just go straight to this room independent of the gravitational field here. But in this situation, in the accelerated frame, of course, the light ray would move in a straight line relative to the inertial system. So in the accelerated box, it would make a curved path, right? So the idea at this time, what most people would have is that this equivalence is not true if I do anything else but free fall experiments. And now Einstein suggested, and he calls this the happiest idea in his life, he suggested that actually it might be true for all sort of experiments. And that was the essential guiding idea which led to the correct theory of, theory of gravity. So we replaced what we call the weak equivalence principle, which uh, is uh, one of the three formulations of this is written here. We replace this by something which is called the strong equivalence principle. And the difference is just in the fact that the restriction to free fall experiments is dropped. So instead of speaking only of free fall experiments, we speak of all sort of experiments you can think of. So if you make experiments with light or thermodynamic experiments or experiments with electromagnetic fields or whatever, this equivalence between these two situations should always hold. That's what we call the strong equivalence principle. I will write this down in a minute. But before doing this, I should make a remark about the experimental basis on which, uh, well, first of all, the weak principle is, um, is resting. So I said that Galileo was the first who did this, uh, who found this out with a rather primitive experiment. And, uh, well, he had, um, he had uh, little, little balls rolling down a, uh, an inclined plane. And with the help of this uh, rather simple apparatus, he, uh, he established uh, this result. Uh, but it's also said that he was doing it uh, with, a, with an experiment in the, uh, in the Lean Tower from, from Pisa. But I think this is not historically really, really established. It's more like a, like, a, like a fairy tale. So what he actually did was experiments in the lab. This is established with these inclined planes. So that's the way in which he tested the, what we now call the weak equivalence principle experimentally. It was then done with much better accuracy in the 19th century. I should mention this. So the weak equivalence principle, weak equivalence principle is experimentally established and the person who did it to a fairly good um, uh, uh, accuracy for the first time was a Hungarian gentleman by the name of Lorand von Oetvers. I asked a Hungarian once how to pronounce this and he told me just drop the E, the E is mute and pronounce this like a German SCH. So the pronunciation is something like Oetvers. So he did this in 18, I don't know, 1880 or 85 or something like that. 
89 and the accuracy, the relative accuracy was 10 to the minus 7. Yeah? So the possible error divided by the quantity itself. So the difference between inertial mass and gravitational mass divided by the inertial mass was, um, uh, could, be, could be verified up to, up to 10 to the minus 7. So this was already a fairly good, uh, good result. So that was the situation when Einstein thought about uh, the equivalence principle. So it was already uh, fairly, fairly accurately established at this time. Nowadays we have better values. The best experiment to test the uh, weak equivalence principle was done at Washington University. And with a typical American uh, tendency for playing with words, they called this the at wash experiment. So WASH stands for Washington, yeah? and of course it sounds similar to the name Edwash, so that's why I call it the Edwash experiment. This was done in 2001, and the accuracy was 10 to the minus 13. So this is uh, now fairly good. And they are um, uh, satellite experiments in the planning stage. So they have not been done. They are, uh, it's hoped that they will be done. Uh, not too far into the future. The first one is a French experiment, which is called microscope. And actually, this is with, um, with the participation of uh, some people from my institute, from ZAUM. So uh, our group, that's a group of Klaus Lemmerzahl, this uh, has, I think, three people who are involved in this microscope experiment. Uh, the, the, main, uh, the main investigators are, are people from France. So it's, a, it's a mainly a France project, but with German participation. And uh, the, uh, accuracy which is expected for this is something like 10 to the minus 15. And there is another one, a NASA experiment, which is called STEP, with some acronym. Don't ask me what it's standing for. Yeah, it's an abbreviation for something. Uh, this is even aiming at 10 to the minus 18. So they are not, uh, uh, they are not flying yet. Uh, I think the more the planning for the time uh, at the moment is that microscope will fly in, in um, 2017, but it was uh, was shifted already a couple of times. So don't ask me when it actually will. But anyway, what we have now, so that's that's the situation we have now. That's already fairly good, right? So we are on a on a sound basis if we assume that the weak equivalence principle is actually true. Okay, but from this, which is well established experimentally, which was already well established at the time of Einstein, now it's a big jump to a much more general principle, which is a yeah, which is an audacious idea, and that's what Einstein suggested, actually a 1907 act uh, already. So Einstein suggested. The strong equivalence principle. So the strong equivalence principle is a statement that this here is true without the restriction to free fall experiments. It's true for all experiments. And there was no experimental basis actually for this at the time of Einstein. So it was really a, a, a rather uh, rather audacious idea. So I could use either the analog of this formulation or of this formulation. Maybe I should write down both because both are interesting. So let's say no. Any sort of experiment of experiment in a box in an inertial system
is undistinguishable distinguishable from the same experiment in a freely falling box. in a homogeneous gravitational field. So I can still use this picture here, but now the claim is that whatever sort of experiment I'm making in this, inside this box, I'm not allowed to uh, make experiments which involve the outside. Yeah? So if you think of an assistant which is outside the box and you send something to him and receive, receive something back, that, that's, out of, uh, that's uh, not inside the, um, the framework of this principle. We are performing experiments only inside the, the box, but we are allowed to do any sort of experiments. And the claim is the two situations are indistinguishable. If you are at rest in an inertial system or freely falling in a gravitational system. And uh, well, that's a, that's a claim. And, uh, of course, it's uh, at first sight uh, something which is, um, yeah, which is not, uh, maybe not, not to be expected. Yeah, but on the other hand, uh, there were no uh, contradictions with experiments at the time when Einstein suggested this. And until now, there are no uh, contradictions with experiment found. So actually this proved very, very fruitful, this idea to generalize the equivalence principle from weak to strong. So that's the first formulation. So equivalent formulation is the following. And that's the most important and most interesting formulation. So that's the formulation equivalent to this statement here. Now without restrictions to free fall experiment. So the statement is we can mimic gravitational fields by acceleration without restricting the experiments we can do in any way. So in a box uniformly accelerated, uniformly accelerated to an inertial system, All experiments, not just the free fall experiments, all experiments are indistinguishable. From experiments in a homogeneous gravitational fields. field. And the sort of experiments which are done in the drop tower in our institute here in Bremen are exactly based on this, on this principle. So the idea is that we want to do experiments under the same situations uh, as, um, as it, um, uh, as it uh, is uh, in, a, in a spacecraft far away from all, from all bodies. So we want to simulate the situation that we are in a spacecraft uh, far away from um, uh, from all uh, from all gravitating bodies, where we have something similar to um, to an inertial system, and what we actually do, the experiments which are actually be done, are experiments in the gravitational field of the Earth, but in a freely falling capsule. So in the drop tower, you can uh, you can uh, put your experiment into a certain container, and then they drop it from the from the top uh, of the tower and it will fall down where the tower has something like 140 meters or so, so it will fall for four seconds or so. So yeah, for four seconds we have the same situation as you have in, in outer space. 
Uh, actually, you can, uh, you can prolong the time by using what they call a catapult. So instead of dropping the container from the top, you can shoot it upwards from the bottom. Well, it's a catapult, not in this, in this sense, with a, with a rubber belt, as <laughs> I just call it a catapult. It's actually working with air pressure. So it is pushed upwards with a, with a very, very strong uh, impact of, of air pressure. And in the beginning, of course, you have to guide it so to make sure that it doesn't bounce against the walls, right? But then it's, it's let free and it's uh, shot upwards and then falling down again. And uh, the both, both uh, uh, parts of the motion together last something like nine seconds, over nine seconds. So we can mimic for nine seconds, yeah, almost zero gravity. Well, of course, the gravitational field is not perfectly homogeneous inside uh, our tower. So what we have is not called zero gravity, it's called microgravity. Yeah, a very small variation of gravitational fields. And that's, that's the M in ZAM. Yeah, ZAM stands for uh, Zentrum für Angewandte Raumfahrttechnologie und Mikrogravitation. That's an English center for applied space technology and uh, microgravity. So the M is microgravity. Very small variations of gravitational fields. That's, uh, and uh, actually this wouldn't work. We wouldn't mimic the situation which, uh, which uh, prevails in spacecraft if the strong equivalence principle wouldn't be true, right? So the whole idea of the drop tower is based on the, uh, on the strong equivalence principle. So that's what Einstein suggested. And now we can, can see what we, what we can uh, deduce from this. So actually, I already mentioned that the second formulation is maybe even more important than the first formulation. So that's this situation. So we can mimic a gravitational field, a homogeneous gravitational field, by considering an inertial system and now going over into another reference system which is uniformly accelerated with respect to this. And this principle alone tells us what happens in a homogeneous gravitational field. So we can now calculate, just on the basis of the strong equivalence principle, effects in a homogeneous gravitational field. We will do this now. We will calculate the light deflection in a homogeneous gravitational field, and we will calculate the redshift in a homogeneous gravitational field. For this, we do not need the apparatus of general relativity. We just need the strong equivalence principle. This alone will tell us what happens. We will not be able to calculate the light deflection in a non-homogeneous gravitational field. So if you want to calculate the light deflection uh, by the sun, yeah, a light ray being deflected by the sun, of course, this principle is not sufficient for this because the field is certainly not homogeneous, the field of the sun, right? But uh, or if we want to, um, to calculate um, as a, as a planetary motion in the field of a gravitational field, there the strong equivalence principle alone wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be, be sufficient. But for the light deflection in a homogeneous gravitational field and for the redshift in the homogeneous gravitational field, the strong equivalence principle is sufficient. And we will now do this calculation. So we do not need Einstein's field equation. We do not need any sort of sophisticated differential geometry, which we have to learn later in order to do this, can just be done on the basis of the strong equivalence principle. And how will we do this? Well, we use this picture as a guiding principle. So we want to know, well, in the first, uh, the first part, we want to know how is the light ray deflected in a homogeneous gravitational field. So what we do is we consider the left hand, uh, um, the, the left situation. So we assume we have an inertial system that's special relativity. We know what an inertial system is, right? We have developed all the formalism. And what we do is we just transfer to another reference system, which is now accelerated, so it's not an inertial system. And we see how the light ray uh, moves relative to such a system. And then we transfer back to the situation in the gravitational field and we get the deflection formula. So that's the way in which this will be done. And of course, you see already uniformly accelerated observers will now play a crucial role. And that's the reason why I discussed them in some detail uh, in preceding uh, lectures and also preceding exercises. These are the famous hyperbolic observers. Hopefully everybody remembers. Yeah, these observers whose world lines are hyperbolas, so they will now play the, the essential role for our calculation. So I should leave this one, yes.
Okay, so the strong equivalence principle allows to calculate a lot of things. Actually, I will, I will uh, show you the calculation for two things. It allows to calculate light deflection. and the redshift in a homogeneous gravitational field. Okay, and that's what we do now. So here's a picture. That's the situation we are actually interested in. We are in a homogeneous gravitational field. We send light rays from one observer to another observer. And we want to find out how this is deflected relative to the, uh, to the box, relative to the elevator. And we want to find out how it is redshifted, if it is moving upwards or downwards with respect to the gravitational field. And what we actually do in the calculation is we consider this situation. Yeah? We assume there's no gravitational field. We assume that we, are, that we have an inertial system, that we are in special relativity. So we consider the full formalism of special relativity without any modification, but we introduce accelerated observers. These are the observers at rest relative to the box. Yeah? And we know how to do this mathematically. So we consider, consider uniformly accelerated observers. So, special relativity. Here's our x naught axis. Here's one axis, which I choose as x1 axis. The other two you have to uh, uh, imagine in your mind. Well, actually, I should, I should do this more symmetrically. So, I should. Sorry, oops, should do this more here. And then hopefully everybody remembers what are the word lines of uniformly accelerated observers. We have discussed them several times. They are hyperbolas, oops. These are the famous Rindler observers. Oh, it's supposed to be <laughs> hyperbolas which are parallel to each other, so I I think this is not a perfect picture, but I hope you get the general idea, right? So we have to restrict to this so-called Rindler wedge. So these observers are only defined in this, um, in this part of, um, of space-time. And for each observer, the word line goes asymptotically to the light cone for uh, past and future infinity. So the particles or the observers arrive moving very, very fast very close to the speed of light, then they slow down, slow down, slow down. They are momentarily at rest here, and then they accelerate back in the positive x direction, and they become faster, 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 and approach the speed of light. So that's what happens if we have uniformly accelerated observers. And we have written the formula for the uh, four velocity of these observers. So at each point, I have such a four velocity vector here. And we have calculated this, and this was something which was Singe and Koch, if you remember. Oh. So the u mu of tau, the four vector, I think, was a over c squared. Is that true? No, just the other way around. Uh, bup, bup, bup. Where do I have the velocity? Uh, no, just the c. Of course, it should have the dimension of a, of a velocity. So there's c, and then I have cos in the time coordinate. Of course, here, a tau over c. A tau over c. A is the acceleration. So uh, constant acceleration a. A 
acceleration A. Then I have here sinh, and here I have zeros. So that's the four velocity of an observer which moves with constant acceleration A. That's what we calculated, I don't know, two weeks ago or so. So I want to have the world line itself. That means the x mu of tau. So I have to integrate this. Yeah, this is just uh, d x mu of tau by d tau. So if I want to have x mu of tau, I have to integrate this. And I want to integrate this with appropriate initial conditions. And the initial conditions I choose in such a way that x mu of 0, so the event which uh, 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 the, pass, uh, the particles meet when, um, when their, um, their standard clock shows time tau equals 0, this I denote by, well, this is a 0 here, and then x, y, and z, capital letters. So the idea is, well, that at tau equals 0, they pass through this plane. And the point where they pass through this plane, that's uh, coordinated by these three spatial coordinates, x, y, and z. Here in this 1 plus 1 dimensional picture, I have only the x, right? So that's what I read here. That's the x. And the y and the z are in the dimension which uh, are um, orthogonal to this plane. So they are not shown in this picture. But through each point of space-time, I, uh, I have such a trajectory. So the y-coordinate comes here, and then the z-coordinate goes into the, into the missing dimension, which cannot be shown here. So I integrate this with this initial condition. So what do I get? I think I can do this in my head. x mu of tau. I try. So what gives this expression if I differentiate it with respect to tau? This must be something with sinh. A tau of c. And if I differentiate this, I get a factor o, a over c. So I must have here c squared over a, right? If I differentiate this now, then I get a divided by c. So one c and the a cancelled, and I'm left with a c. So that's correct. And the initial condition is correct, right? For tau equals 0, this gives a 0. That's fine. For the second term, I get the same with a cosh instead of the sinh. Tau over c. And now I have to be careful. If I have tau equals 0, then this would give a 1, right? So I have to subtract this 1, c squared over a, and then I have to add the x. So now the initial condition is correct, right? So if I differentiate this, I get this here. a over c, a over c, yes, I think that's true. Yes, this is constant, so it drops out if I differentiate. And the initial condition, if I set tau equal to 0, this cancels against this, and I'm left with x. That's what I want to have. And here I have a constant, and the constants, of course, must be the y. And here I have a constant, and the constants must be the z. So that's it. So these are the world lines parameterized by capital X, Y, Z. So X, Y, Z. Oops! X, Y, Z parameterize the points in the accelerated. reference system. So in the box, if you think of this picture, right? Every point in the box here in this picture is characterized by a certain set of coordinates x, y, and z. Okay, and now I consider a photon, a classical photon. My goal is to derive how a uh, how a light ray, or in particle picture, a classical photon, is deflected. So I consider a classical photon, which moves through the space-time. So I can immediately uh, characterize the motion of the photon with respect to my inertial system. 
And what I have to calculate then, with the help of these equations I've written down, is how the photon moves relative to these world lines. Yeah? So I now watch the photon with the eyes of observers which are living on these integral curves. This means with the eyes of observers which are at rest in this, in this box. So the photon is moving in this way. I think now I need another dimension. So I have x0 here. I have x1 here, and I have x2 here. Of course, I don't want to restrict to the situation that the photon moves in the same direction in which the system is accelerated, right? I want to have it, uh, I want to have it uh, moving in a direction transverse to this. So, but it's no restriction to assume that it is in the x1, x2 plane. Why is this? Well, the x1 direction is the direction of acceleration. And so my photon would have a component in the direction of the acceleration and perpendicular to it. And the direction perpendicular to it, I can make into the x2 direction. Yeah? I'm still free to make rotations in the direction perpendicular to the direction of the acceleration. So that's no restriction of a generality to assume that it is in the x1, x2 plane. So then it would have a world line like this here under 45 degrees, so that's the that's, uh, word line of the photon. So if I project this into the x1, x2 plane, I get an angle theta here. So this angle theta tells me how the photon moves relative to the direction in which the acceleration is, right? Theta equals zero would mean the photon moves precisely in the direction of the acceleration, or of the gravitational field which I want to mimic. And uh, yeah, uh, theta equal pi half would mean it moves perpendicular to the direction of the acceleration, for instance. Well, what's the world line of the photon? So the four, momen uh, four momentum of the photon of the photon, it's an, oh no, it, it's, it's jumping ahead. No, no, uh, I, that was too, too fast. Let me first write about, uh, the, the world line. So the world line of the photon Well, remember, photons do not have something like proper time, right? Proper time exists only for particles which move with a speed slower than the speed of light, so I cannot parameterize the world line by proper time. I just choose any parameter. It, has, it need not have any physical meaning. Convenient way would be to use just the x0 coordinate. So I use as a parameter on this world line just the value which I read from the x0 axis then the world line would be something like this. So that's also an x mu. I make an index p, p for photon, to distinguish it from this x mu. Yeah? So the index p means that's the photon, and it will depend on a parameter I call s. And I choose my s such that it is just the x0 coordinate. And then I can read from the picture how the other coordinates read. So um, the thing must go under 45 degrees. So obviously I should have here s times cosine of theta, and here is sine of theta, zero. Is this in agreement with this picture? The theta is, yes, this angle, yeah, I think that's, that's true. Yeah, this goes under 45 degree, degrees because I have here the same s, and the angle with respect to the x1 axis is given by this angle theta. So that's the formula for the world line. And now I want to have the equation which tells me so that's the world line given, of course, in the inertial coordinates, x0, x1, x2, x3. So it tells me how the photon moves if I watch it with the eyes of the inertial observers. And I want to find out how it moves if I watch it with the eyes of the accelerated observers. What I have to do is, I just have to equate this expression with this expression. And then I get the world line of the photon in terms of the coordinates capital X, capital Y, capital Z of the accelerated observers. And then we can discuss what sort of curve we get.
Okay, so let's just squeeze this here. Uh, yeah, okay, that's too narrow. Oh, let's say derive world line. Of the photon in the XYZ system. It's an accelerated system. So I have the world line of my photon, xp mu of s. And for each point on this world line, so for each value of s, I want to find out what are the capital X, Y, Z coordinates of this point. So I just have to equate this to x mu of tau, to the world lines of these observers, which are parameterized by x, y, z. So let me write this out. So this gives the following. So the zero component is S is C squared over A sinh of A tau over C. Yeah? I just compare the X naught components of the two things. Then I compare the X1 components. This is S cosine theta. This is this here. C squared over A cos A tau over C minus C squared over A plus X. And the other ones are easy. And I have as sine theta is just y, and 0 is z. OK, this gives me four <laughs> equations. I can eliminate the tau from these four equations, and then I get capital X, capital Y, and capital Z as functions of, z, of, of s. This gives me the world line in the x, y, z system. So, well, that's... So for x is the most complicated one. So if I solve this for x, I get what? So x is on this side. Then I have, if I take this to the other side, c squared over a. And this comes with 1 minus cos. And cos is square root of 1 plus sinh. So it's square root 1 plus a squared, uh, s squared, divided by c to the 4. So that's these two terms, and then I have plus s cosine theta. So that's x as a function of s. And the other two are easy. y is s times sine theta, and that is 0. OK, that's the world line of the photon in the x, y, and z system. Yeah? If s runs from minus infinity to plus infinity, this gives me a curve in the x, y, z system, and that's precisely the path of the particle of the of the classical photon in the in the x, y, z system in the accelerated system. 
and we can discuss this now. Uh, do I manage? Yeah, okay. Uh, I won't manage to uh, finish this completely, but I think I can do the light deflection. So that's the first thing. The second will be the, um, uh, the redshift light deflection. And, well, I will develop the formula only for the case that theta is pi half. So this means that the photon is in the x2 direction when it goes through the, the origin. Yeah? So that's the, my, my direction of acceleration. Maybe I should point in this direction, yeah? because it's better for mimicking the gravitational field. So we accelerate in this direction. And I want to consider the case that the photon crosses this direction under 90 degrees yeah, at an angle of pi half. And I want to derive the shape of the path of the, uh, the, the photon for this situation. So that's the case that theta is pi half. Of course, you can also calculate it for the case that the axis is, is cut under any other angle. Of course, if you have a parallel, then it's boring. Yeah? Then, of course, there's no deflection whatsoever. Yeah? If you do it in this way, that's the acceleration, and you shoot your photon in this direction, then it's not deflected at all. It's just going up straight. But for any other angle, it would be deflected. And we do the case that it goes under 90 degrees. So then we have x. So cosine of uh, pi half is 0, right? So this term is just not there. So we have c squared over a, 1 minus root 1 plus a squared s squared over c to the 4. And y is s. Sine of pi half is, um, uh, is 1. And that is, of course, 0. I don't write this because it's always 0. So the relevant things happen in the xy plane. Well, what is this? Do you see this immediately? What is this geometrically? What sort of a curve there is this in the xy system? Well, if you do not see it, maybe juggle a little bit around with the terms. You can write x squared. If you have a square root, it's always good to, to square. Or is it? Uh, no, we do something else. Uh, we take this to the other side, and then we square. So we write c squared over a minus x is, now this is on the other side, c squared over a square root 1 minus a squared s squared c to the 4. And if I square this, then I get c squared minus x squared is c to the 4 over a squared 1 minus a squared over c to the 4, and s squared is y squared. So now it's better to see what it is. So this is this term. I take the y, the one with the y to the other side. I have c4 and a squared cancelled, so I just get y squared. Is oh, with a plus, what did I do? I made a sign mistake somewhere. Where did I make a sign mistake? I should have a minus sign here. They should have different signs. Where's the sign mistake? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Here, just a writing mistake. See, just a writing mistake. So here was a plus. Here was a plus, and if I take it to the other side, it becomes a minus. That's correct. Now we should see what it is. So if I plot this in the xy system, let me draw the x-axis vertical. Here, yeah, this gives better the impression that I mimic a gravitational field, which is pointing downward. X is the direction of the acceleration. So then the y direction would be this here. Yeah. Usually you have x here and y there, and now I rotate it by 90 degrees. And it looks like that. What is this? What is this in the... You see this? So it goes through this point with a horizontal tangent. That's what we, what we assumed from the beginning, because we choose the theta in this way. Well, if we had just this here, what would this be? x squared minus y squared is a constant. What would this be? Hyperbola, Hyperbola yes. And what is ha what's happening here is just that the origin is shifted. Why right? is it still a hyperbola? Just It's not a hyperbola which has asymptotes uh, uh, in this way, 
but rather the asymptotes are shifted. So it's something like this, and it goes through this point. So it's a hyperbola. So that's a light deflection in the accelerated system. So if you send a light ray through this room, yeah, we are in a gravitational field. We can mimic this gravitational field by an accelerated system relative to an inertial system. And our calculation tells us that the light ray moves on a hyperbola. So if we send a light ray from one corner of the room to the other corner, it will move in a hyperbola. We can calculate how big this effect is. So for gravitational field of the Earth, of the Earth, so we have A equal to this uh, gravitation, uh, 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 gravitational acceleration of the, of the Earth field, which, as you certainly know, is something like um, 9.8 meter per second squared. So you can insert this here, and then you can calculate, well, for a certain distance uh, y, you can calculate the distance x by which the thing is deflected. And I did this. I can give you the numerical value, which you find here. It's not particularly impressive. So for y, say, well, a typical, typical uh, uh, scale of, uh, of, of a room like the size here, let's say 10 meters. Yeah, that's something which you could do in a, in a lab. Then you would get x, which according to this, uh, according to this formula would be something like uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 15 meter. So it's not very impressive, right? So you couldn't, you couldn't easily uh, detect this effect just uh, with an experiment here in this room. So it's... Um, it's, of course, it's a tiny effect. But if you believe in the strong equivalence principle, then this effect would be there. And so you can understand the basic idea that gravitational fields deflect light rays according to Einstein theory. You can deduce this on the basis of the equivalence principle alone. You don't need the field equation. You don't need the uh, setting of differential geometry for this. But it only works for a homogeneous gravitational field. Yeah? You cannot calculate the deflection of a more complicated gravitational field. But in a homogeneous gravitational field, it's this effect. So, uh, yeah, this was the first calculation, and I time is out, so we uh, have to do the, the, uh, the redshift uh, on Thursday, right? Maybe I should mention already now that next Thursday I have to be in Oldenburg uh, at the, in early afternoon. I try to be here on time, but I cannot promise. Maybe I come a, a few minutes late. Yeah? So if I'm not here at 4.15 on Thursday, I just don't leave immediately. Maybe I come a few minutes late. I try to be on time, but I cannot promise. We'll never know how the traffic is. <laughs> so um, that's, um, uh, that's for next week. And on Wednesday, of course, we have the tutorial. I would be happy if a few more would show up at the tutorials. The last tutorial was not very well, um, uh, uh, well visited. So actually, I consider the tutorials a fairly essential part of the, of the whole thing. And if you want to take an exam, then I think it's, uh, it's a good idea to do, the, to do the exercises carefully. Because I try to choose them in a way that they are really, um, that they are really uh, that it gives you a good idea of the important things which we discuss in the in the lectures. Okay, have a nice weekend.